Happy Easter. I love Easter. I mean, Easter for any pastor is like the Super Bowl and your favorite candidate winning the election all rolled into one. And then, and then what makes today even better is not only is it Easter Sunday, but it's Baptism Sunday. And uh, that's right, a little, little, little cheer for baptisms. Some One person cares about baptisms. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having trouble uh, concentrating because so many of you all look so different. I mean, it's amazing what a little shower and some clean clothes do for you. You, sh you should try this more often. Um, so, uh, uh, Baptism Sunday, uh, we're going to do things a little different. Um, what we always do is we prepare ahead of time for baptisms and um, we make a video or in the, uh, actually in today's or in this service, um, we'll have a testimony read. Um, but it's always pre-scripted and prepared ahead of time. And, and today, as we were preparing this service, um, we just really felt um, God leading us to, to open baptisms up to anyone that really felt moved by the Spirit um, to be baptized. And so during any part of this service, if you decide, you know what, like this is the day I want to take the step into the waters of baptism. Um, we've got all the supplies in the back. We've got extra shirts and shorts and towels and all that fun stuff. And so as we're going through the service, I just ask that um, you'd pray about that. Um, today's message is a bit different. Typically, sermons for me come out of um, quite a bit of research. I can't talk. This is third service. I can't talk. Um, I really can't talk because I'll just, I can't, whatever word that was, it's not going to come out um, because I, I love to prepare. I'm a nerd. And, and so um, I, I, they take quite a bit of preparation. But, but today, it really, I just felt um, this word just flowed out of me. And I think that God has a word that he wants us to hear, that he wants to proclaim over us. Um, so let's just pray and then we'll dive in. Holy Father, we thank you for this space. We thank you for the sacred and holy space where we can stand in your presence. We thank you for those uh, people on our worship team who led us into your presence this morning. I pray that as, um, as I would speak, that it not be my words, but yours, and that you would just flow through me, and that someone would hear a word from you that they need. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I want to talk about the other side. Now, all of us have had the experience of, the, uh, of being on the other side, and it's simply that moment when you have experienced or gone through something, and now it's in your rearview mirror. So, for example, the other side is that trip that you have planned for months and months, and the anticipation was killing you, but now it's over, and all you have left are your memories and a thousand photos on your iPhone. The other side, is, one other person has too many phones, photos. I legitimately, last trip, a thousand photos. The other side is when you're in the middle of grad school, or when you're in grad school, and you're not sure if you're going to make it through, but then you're on the other side, and you have a job, and someone actually pays you to do something. You are almost an adult. The other side is when you have this massive project at work that consumes all of your time and energy and your friends have forgotten you existed. But now that project is done. It is in your rearview mirror and you are looking back. The other side is when you were in a relationship that was the defining relationship of your life and you thought it was going to last for a lifetime, but now it's in shambles and you are looking back on what could have been from the other side. The other side is when maybe you were abused or mistreated as a child, and now you're an adult, and in your head, you know that you are, that's long in your past, but yet there are voices that keep speaking to you from that period on the other side, from that time when you were a child. Sometimes when we're on the other side and we look back, there are incredible fond memories. Maybe it was a long road, but you wouldn't trade the experience for anything. But others of you, when you look back from the other side, you were flooded with pain and anger and regret and anxiety. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at Easter from the other side of resurrection. Because I believe that on the other side of the cross, I believe that on the other side of resurrection, that God has a word for us, a word of hope and a word of new possibility. The story that has been told over your life, the story that has been written does not have the final word. It does not define you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. John 20, beginning with verse 19. 
On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were gathered together, this is Resurrection Sunday, they're gathered together. They're on the other side of the cross. We as the readers have the um, privilege of um, seeing that they're also on the other side of resurrection, but they don't know that. All they know is that they're on the other side of the cross. They watch their best friend be hanged on a tree and then his body shoved in a tomb. And so there they are gathered, and the disciples were together, and the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. This is what we've been talking about in our series, Practicing the Way of Jesus. That as followers of Jesus, as people who call ourselves disciples of Jesus, that we are commissioned and we are called to go out into the world and to do the things that Jesus did. And so he says, I am sending, as the Father sent me, now I am sending you. But then he says this, and with, or then we read this, and with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we spent about six weeks in this series, Practicing the Way of Jesus, where it's been a very practical, tactile series. Like, there's something you could bite your teeth into. There were steps how you could practice the spiritual disciplines. But underneath everything we were talking about was the power of the Spirit. And so not next Sunday, but the week following that, we are going to do a a six-week series on the power and the experience of the Spirit in our lives. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, his friends called him Diddy, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. This is something I missed every time I read this text because the disciples are in the house again and what's happening? The doors are locked. Just to set the stage, just a week earlier, they were in an upper room. They had the doors locked for fear that they might lose their life and all of their hopes and all their expectations had been shattered. It makes sense that you're locked in an upper room afraid. But now they're on the other side of resurrection. A week later, they saw somebody killed and now they saw that person in the flesh alive. They have touched his wounds. They know it was the same Jesus. But yet a week later, it seems that they've all, fear has begun to creep back in because they're once again locked in a room. Now, my initial reaction is to judge them, but I end up doing the same thing in my life. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hands and put them in my side. The Jesus story was not that unusual up until this point. There is a long history in Israel of Messiah's coming and promising freedom from whatever ruling authority, promising them freedom from the Roman emperor or freedom from the Roman empire. And and, and then Rome does what it does best. It stamps out Messiah's. And so Jesus was not the first person to claim to be the Messiah, and he was definitely not the first person to be executed for being the Messiah. And the way the story typically goes is that Rome would execute the Messiah, and then whatever of his followers did not make themselves scarce, make themselves small, did not fade into the background, they would have the same fate as the Messiah. So this is why Jesus' disciples are gathered in an upper room with the doors locked, because they know that if they don't disappear into the background, they will have the same fate as Jesus. And this has to be an incredibly... um, not just sad evening because their best friend has just died, but it also just has to be incredibly um, demoralizing evening because they had all these hopes and expectations. Two weeks earlier, they were talking about who was going to sit on his right and his left in this new kingdom that he was establishing, and now he's dead, and along with him, all their hopes and their dreams. Now, I imagine in this evening that... They, um, 
begin just hanging out and chatting because you can't spend three years walking together with Jesus without moving from being fellow disciples to becoming friends. Otherwise, if they weren't friends, they would have scattered out to all sorts of different homes. But for whatever reason, they come together, they join together. And I think that in this moment, they're sitting and they're eating hummus and they're drinking wine. And this, I know this is Easter Sunday and, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I think they had a glass or two too much. And so they are sitting there on the other side of the cross and they are drinking wine and they're talking about what they saw and what they experienced with Jesus. They talk about the story of the man, of the friends who literally dismantled a roof and let a man down into their midst so that Jesus could heal them. And they're like, that was amazing. Or do you remember that time that guy, that, that, that girl was dead and Jesus raised her? Or do you remember the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and all she had to do was touch the hem of his garment and the bleeding stopped? That was incredible. And then as the evening went on, the, the stories got slightly sillier. They're like, do you remember the look on the Pharisee's face when Jesus ate with sinners? That was priceless. And then, and then, they, and then they said, do you, do you remember the time that Jesus told us to steal a donkey? Like Jesus legitimately told us to steal someone's donkey and they begin to laugh. And then they said, do you remember the day that Peter tried to walk on water and he ended up getting a nose full? And, and, and then everyone starts ribbing Peter because everyone always makes fun of Peter because Peter is an easy target. He always talks first and thinks later. And in the middle of this moment where they were reliving their time with Jesus, the risen Jesus appears in their midst and Jesus says, peace be with you. Now, I believe that Jesus does not say peace be with you because he's like a Zen Buddhist master or something. He's just like, hum, peace. No, Jesus says peace be with you because Peter is screaming. In fact, they're probably all screaming because the doors were locked and now there is a dude standing in their midst and Jesus is like, peace be with you. It's okay. It's just me. It's Jesus. And Jesus appears in their midst. The person, the man, their friend, the Messiah that they had seen die and his body placed in a tomb and the last they knew he was decaying outside the walls of the city. He is now standing in their midst. And in that moment, in that moment with Jesus, the story is completely retold. What had been a story of nostalgia, what had been a story of missed possibilities and missed opportunities, what had been a story of what could have been has now been completely transformed. The story that came before it is the same, but now through their experience with the risen Jesus, the story is retold. And now where there was darkness and despair and suffering, there is hope and new possibilities because the Messiah, Jesus, was standing in front of their midst. It's interesting how when stories are retold in the future, the situation is still the same, but somehow it, it impacts us in a different way. I have an example of this, and it's a terrible example, and, and just give you a disclaimer up front. Um, you're thinking, wow, that, he could have had a better example. I agree, but this is the best I've got for you on Easter Sunday. I'm bringing my A game. Um, so in college, uh, a couple of my friends and I decided that we were gonna go camping for spring break. Um, we knew nothing about camping. I'm not a camper, um, but we had no plans and we decided we should do something for spring break. So at the last minute, we borrowed a friend's tent and we hopped in a Kia Optima, which is a great car, I can tell you. And uh, we hopped in a Kia Optima and headed to the woods, three of us. And um, the first night was decent. I mean, it wasn't the best night of our lives, but it wasn't so bad. But we were camping in Oklahoma because we went to school in Oklahoma and, and we, we hadn't checked the weather beforehand. And even if we had, it was Oklahoma and the weather changes every minute. And so by the end of the second night, we had a flash flood warning and we had a tornado. And um, I, I, I blocked out most of this evening, but I remember my friend and I, we had not, um, I, I had to keep asking the previous services, you stake a tent, right? It's, yes, I think you stake a tent. I said anchored or moored and people looked at me like I was weird. We had not properly staked our tent. And so when the first like gush of wind came through, it ripped our tent up. And I have this vivid memory of my friend and I running through the torrential rain across the state park chasing after our tent as it blew away. But then, we did not catch it. Then, 
And then, then we are, that we have no place to shelter other than the Kia Optima, and there's six of us. That's a different story. I'll get to that in a minute. Now there's six of us, and so we have no place to shelter from the rain and the storm other than the bathroom floor of a state park. Now, the problem was that the drain in the, the bathroom had clogged. And so the rainwater is beginning to come in the door as, it, as a, like it's a torrential downpour. And so there's a, just a little, just enough on the bathroom floor to allow all the goodness to kind of mix together. And we had no chairs or anything to sit on. And so there we are, the six of us, sitting on a state park bathroom floor in water that is disgusting, and we've gathered around an ice chest that has become a mo- makeshift poker table. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was the worst night of my life. But here's what made it even better. My best friend and I, who was with me, we we're rather con- uh, persuasive individuals, and we'd had some friends who had gone to the beach for spring break. And we called them and told them they would have more fun if they came camping with us. They arrived one hour before the storm hit. It was not a fun evening. So anyway, so here we are, we're sitting, and it's the worst night of our life. In fact, we, I legitimately blocked out most of that evening. I, I remember being in the bathroom, sitting in the floor in the water, and I remember the drive home the next day and the smell on the car. What happens between here and here, I honestly don't know. I don't remember where I slept, if I slept sitting up, if I slept at all. Okay, here's why I tell you this story. Now when my friends and I get together, that's like one of the defining moments in our friendship. I mean, when we retell that story, we laugh until our stomachs hurt. And they remind me of parts of that story that I had totally forgotten and totally blocked out. And what was at one time the worst moment of my life has now become one of the defining moments of my friendship and one of the best and funniest stories I have to tell when we get together. There's a way that when a story is retold with those who are closest to us and those who have experienced a situation with us, that the story can be redeemed as we tell it on the other side. The facts of the story never changed, but in the retelling, it impacts us in a different way. This night in Jerusalem has been completely transformed through their encounter with Jesus. On the other side of resurrection, the story has been redeemed. Where darkness once reigned, light has broken in. Where the story was once of death and decay, on the other side of resurrection, it is a celebration of new life. Doubt has been replaced with belief. Fear has been replaced with peace. This is the resurrection story. The resurrection story is that things that were once dead, things that seemed hopeless, possibilities and dreams that have died do not have to stay that way. Resurrection means that there can be hope, there can be new life. Stories from your past, who you were, does not have to define who you're going to be. A new story can be written. The arc of the gospel is this, that when people have a relationship with Jesus, their story is retold. Their story is redeemed. Things that had been given up for dead, people that had been given up for dead, situations that seemed hopeless, lives that were broken now have new life, new possibility. The gospel is full of people on the other side. People who through their encounter with the Jesus story, their life story has been retold. For their entire lives, they were known as the outcast, as the crippled, as the untouchable, as the weirdo, as the person who didn't belong, as the, center, as the sinner, as the person who had, had a failed job or failed relationships or anger management issues. But Jesus gives them a new story. And what was once a story of sorrow and failure has become a story of celebration. The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, she has energy for the first time in her life. The man who is blind from birth can now see. Nobody can believe it. The woman who had been told her entire life that her place was in the kitchen is invited to study at the feet of a rabbi. The man who couldn't walk is running circles around everyone. The rough fisherman with a hair trigger temple has now become a leader in the Jesus movement. The woman who was caught in adultery, who had been told her entire life that her only value and worth was in what her body could provide, she has a realization for the first time that she is the beloved child of God. 
on the other side of resurrection, on the other side of our encounter with Jesus, our stories are retold. And wherever you are in whatever story has been told over your life, it does not have the final word. But there's something that stood out to me in this story as I read it again. In John 20, 20, if you still have your Bibles open, we read this. And after he said this, so he's just appeared in the room, and after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. On the other side of resurrection, Jesus appears, the resurrected Jesus, a man who is dead and is now alive, he appears and he still has his scars. I never thought about how weird that is. But if I'm like playing the God figure and I'm raising people from the dead, they're gonna have a perfect body on the other side of resurrection. If I'm going to all that trouble to raise them from the dead, I'm going to like erase the few little blemishes that they've got going on. But on the other side of resurrection, Jesus' scars are still there. They don't go away. And you know this. Those of you who have taken the plunge and have decided to follow Jesus and you are on the other side of resurrection, you know that you don't forget the shame or the unkind words spoken of you. You don't forget the failure or the relationships that fell apart. But the thing is, those stories no longer have power over you. Those stories no longer define who you are because they are being retold in light of Jesus' power. They're being told on the other side of the resurrection. The person that you've told, the person you've been told your whole life you have to be is not the person you have to continue being. And what happens on the other side of the resurrection is the scars which were once a sign of shame and failure and brokenness, the scars have become holy. The scars have become a witness to God's power. And in your new story, those scars, your scars, they become a sign of what you've overcome, not your failure and pain. They become a witness to God's power and redemption. Jesus' story becomes our story. Jesus' hope becomes our hope. Jesus' resurrection becomes our resurrection. Paul says it this way. We were therefore buried with him through baptism in, into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might have new life. This, by the way, is why at the table, baptisms are a big deal and why we get a bit out of sorts and we whoop and we holler and we scream because we believe that in the waters of baptisms, the story that has been told over your life dies and you are raised to new life and to a new story. You are raised to a story that tells you you are the beloved child of God and there is nothing you could do to separate yourself from God's love. But it's not simply a story that tells you that God loves you, but it is also a story that tells you that you are being raised to life in a new community, into a new family. You are stuck with us now. You are stuck with people who cry with you during the difficult moments of life and who celebrate the wins with you. You have family to do the journey of life together with. That's what baptism's all about. That's why we get so excited because we just got a new family member. Someone is having a new story written, a new story told over their lives. And we are invited to participate in Jesus' resurrection. And like Jesus, the scars, the scars that were once a sign of our weakness have become a sign of victory. But the thing is, I can't get this, the, the image, I can't get the image of, of the scars out of my mind. And so as I began to think about it, I, I thought about the Luke's version of the story. In Luke chapter 24, and I'm not going to read the whole passage to you, but in Luke chapter 24, after, on the other side of the cross, there are a few men who are walking um, from Jerusalem, which is where Jesus had been crucified, and they're on their way outside the city, on their way to Emmaus, because they're getting out of Dodge, because they know that if they don't get out of the city or they don't hide, they're going to lose their life. And so here they are on this road, and as they're traveling outside of Jerusalem, a dude shows up in their midst. Now, we as the reader know that this person is Jesus, but for whatever reason, the text tells us that their eyes were clouded and they didn't know who it was. And Jesus starts just having a little fun with them. You should read the whole passage, Luke 24. It's, it's a really interesting story. But as they're walking along 
And it, it, the text tells us that they're downcast. Jesus shows up in their midst, starts walking with them, and says, what's up, guys? What you talking about? Well, you know, Jesus, we're talking about, or, you know, weird fellow who showed up in our midst, we're talking about everything that's happened in Jerusalem. What are you talking? Something happened in Jerusalem? I don't know what you're talking about. And their exact response, you can read it, it's in the text. Are you the only person in, the, like, the entire city who doesn't know what just happened? And Jesus just keeps up the charade. He's like, no, well, what happened? Tell me the story. And so then over the next 10 to 15 verses, they begin to recount the story of like, there was this guy, he had possibility. We thought he was the Messiah, the one we'd been waiting for, and now he's dead. I'm just like, cool. So they keep walking, and then when they get to, the, get to their house, Jesus continues to keep up the charade. And, and it's, the text tells us that he pretends that he's going to keep on walking by their house. Like, guys, thanks for the journey. It's good hanging out with you. Um, see you later sometime. And then they're like, you want to have dinner? Ah, I thought you'd never ask. So Jesus comes in. And we read this in verse 30, Luke 24, verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he began to give it to him, them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. In the ancient world, when you were offering bread to someone, you would go like this. You would tear it and then you'd place it out. And I think that's in that moment as Jesus tears the bread and extends his hands that they see his scars. And it's in his scars that they, rec that they recognize him. See, because the disciples know what we already know intuitively. Never trust anyone without scars. See, for far too long, religious people, religious people have told a resurrection story without telling stories of scars and heartbreak and brokenness. And the person who goes on and on, listen, you, you will not hear this in a church very often. Don't trust the person who goes on and on about their spiritual strength and vitality. Trust the person who tells you that following Jesus is a daily struggle. That's a daily decision that they have to make. The world is tired of people telling stories of resurrection without scars because the most interesting thing about you, the most interesting thing about you is your brokenness. It's your failure. It's the things you've overcome. This is why we encourage our leaders at the table that they need to lead out of vulnerability. Nobody cares about your strengths. They care about what you've overcome, what you've been through. Your weaknesses that with Jesus, you are now on the other side of. For far too long, resurrection people have been leading without their scars. They were pretending that everything is okay and everything is put together. And resurrection without scars is simply empty words and platitudes. The power and the witness of the resurrection is found in your scars. The witness of the resurrection is found in your scars. The resurrected Jesus meets us in our brokenness. He meets us in our failure. He meets us in the space of our deepest pain because Jesus was broken. Jesus has scars. And we have a Savior who entered into, into the darkest spaces in our lives and walks with us through those spaces because he has experienced brokenness. And when he meets us, in his resurrection, he retells our story on the other side. The old scars aren't gone. They're still there. But on the other side of resurrection, on the other side of baptism, when we look back, we see that our scars have become our glory. The scars become a witness to new life. The scars become a sign of hope. And resurrection is not something that is simply offered in some future yonder, some future by and by. But we, as followers of Jesus, believe that his resurrection power is available to us here and now, today. The resurrected king is resurrecting us. The stories that have been told no longer have to define us. But instead, you are invited into a new story 
a story of hope and change and grace. You are invited into a story where you are called to live beyond yourself. You are invited into a story where you're called to accept love and forgiveness. But then you are called to become people who extend love and forgiveness. You were invited to allow your scars, to allow your weakness, to allow your brokenness, to allow those things in your life that are your greatest shame to become a sign of hope, to become a sign that your wounds do not have the final word. In just a moment, Dufier is going to step into the waters of baptism. And in these waters, her story is being retold. Her story is being rewritten. And all of us gathered here get to celebrate with her this decision, this proclamation that I have decided to follow Jesus. But as I told you, as I was preparing this sermon, it just began to flow out of me. And I felt that God wanted us to hear this word that that our scars do not define us, that God wants to tell a new story over our lives. And, and as I was writing the sermon, I just kept feeling impressed by the spirit that I was supposed to open baptism up to anyone who wanted to respond today. And so God and I began to have an argument because if you know me, I love systems and I love structure and data points and everything being in its place and being able to control it. And so we began to have this argument and then I used the trump card on God. I said, what will Jessica think? And she's our executive pastor and she loves systems more than I do. And when I told her the idea, knowing that she was going to shoot it down, she says, no, let's do it. So here's what we did. We got, like I said, we have extra shorts and shirts and towels and all those things. If, as if you were sitting here today, if you just felt God saying, today is the day that you need to take the water, plunge into the waters of baptism. Today's the day that you need to allow your story to be rewritten. You can't continue to allow stories from your past to define your future. I want to invite you to step into the waters of baptism. And I want to celebrate with you. As Dufier comes and prepares, um, her story is going to be read as she goes into the waters of baptism. Um, she, she had been attending the table and has come, uh, but then had to move to New York. And she came all the way back from New York and to, be, to celebrate baptism with us. And so we're so excited. Um, and here's what I want you to do. At the table, I don't partially, I want, to, I want you to participate with me and I want you to not be afraid when this happens. We get a bit wild. When someone comes out of the waters of baptisms, we hoop and we holler and we scream and we celebrate because we have a new family member. Because someone is allowing a new story to be written over their lives. And so as we go forward, we're gonna sing a song and then um, we'll hear her story and then Dufier will step into the waters of baptism. And I just encourage you to celebrate with us. And if you are here and you're like, you know what? I'm ready to take that step. I'm ready to take that plunge. You can just go out the back door. Someone will meet you. They'll show you where the room is with all the supplies. We would love to celebrate that decision with you. Would you pray with me? Please stand. God, we thank you. We thank you that resurrection was not something that happened simply a long time ago in a faraway place, but that your resurrection power is available to us here and now in this moment. And I pray that you just help us to say yes, wherever we are, those of us who are feeling the tug to step into the waters of baptisms, help us to be able to say yes to you. And we pray for Dufier as she steps in this water. And I pray as she steps in the water and as she dies to the old and raises to new life, that you would give her a new story. In Jesus' name, amen.